Hey everyone, Derek here to reconstruct the prehistoric past and journey deep into history's marvels and mysteries with you. So I am fresh off our Egypt tour, and in this episode I am super excited to be joined by several special guests uh, who joined me on our Egypt tour, uh, each of whom I now consider a friend. And we are going to kind of do a roundtable discussion regarding all these mysteries of Egypt and so many things that we experienced together on the tour. And um, I know I speak for all of us when I say I wish all 30 plus of us could uh, be on this podcast that won on the tour, but that would be a, a nightmare to manage on a podcast. Um, so I've got seven of you here or six of you, and I'm going to quickly introduce you. And um, for those that are going to be watching this by video just wave at the screen when I uh, mention you so first up we got Dr. Carla from Texas I believe you're in the Austin area and uh, really excited Carla to talk to you kind of about some of these modern day medical technological breakthrough uh, therapies that you're seeing that are being used to heal the body holistically and what you learned about the the ancient Egyptians basically doing the same thing in these ancient temples. It's going to be cool to ask you about. Uh, next, we got Alan from Montana. Alan, thanks for being here. Alan is a geologist, and I'm excited to ask you your thoughts as a geologist um, on why these uh, pre-Diluvian, we'll call them, uh, ancient Egyptians were using certain types of stones uh, to build these pyramids and these other structures. Um, next, we got Dave and Becky from the UK. <laughs> it was really cool to have uh, Europe represented on the tour and excited to ask you guys about, uh, Dave, you're a stone cutter. So you cut stone for a living with machines and I think like 3D printing machines. So super excited to ask you about how... <laughs> Your takeaways seeing how these ancient uh, pre-Diluvian Egyptians uh, seem to have been crafting these pyramids and these blocks, some that are over a thousand tons with precision, uh, some of these statues featuring muscle tone. I want you to tell us how they did it. Um, next, we've got um, Tim from Ohio and Tim um is a uh, military serviceman he served our country and it was kind of cool to hear your story you've read all kinds of books on these these topics and we had some great discussions so super excited to ask you i want to get your take specifically tim on the pre-diluvian ancient egyptians versus the dynastic ancient egyptians and see what you got to say then we've got jason from uh california you had a crazy experience in one of these ancient temples that I can't wait to ask you about and have everybody here. So I think we got everybody. Thanks again for taking your time out to be with me today, guys. And it was so cool to be with you in Egypt. Uh, it was crazy, right? By the end of that tour, we were literally like kids at a kid's camp. We were best friends. It was the coolest group of people I think I've ever hung out with. Yeah, everybody got along. There was no fights. There was no drama. And um, none of us really seemed like we wanted to leave. We were having so much fun. So um, let's dive into this. Uh, Dr. Carla, you are from Texas. Um, you work in the medical field. Um, tell us a little bit about some of these uh, modern day medical technological therapies, breakthroughs that we were talking about that are being used to uh, heal the body holistically, maybe through like resonance. And then your takeaways learning from Muhammad Ibrahim, our, our tour guide and Egyptologist, about how these ancient Egyptians were doing some of the same things in these ancient temples. Your thoughts? Yeah, and I work in functional neurology. So what does that look like? There's so many inputs that go into the body that create a certain output. Um, so I already use things like electric stimulation, laser, resonance, um, hydrogenated oxygen, frequency, sound to send different signals into the nervous system to help regulate the nervous system. So when I learned from Muhammad that this was, these were created basically to enhance 
the energy frequencies of humans. I was just like, how did they know all of this back then? And instead of looking at necessarily like blood work and labs, it's so much, we are electrical creatures and so much of our, our bodies respond to the electricity from earth. And so it, this is the ways that we're trying to discover now currently to how can we input into the nervous system without it necessarily being like a drug or surgery. So there are, uh, a friend of mine has this resonance bed, which I brought up to you, uh, where it's this chamber you lay on and it emits a vibration, which is similar to earth's vibration. It also releases molecular hydrogen. It has sound and voice. It has red light. It has, um, you know, goes through different, different waveform patterns to basically reset your nervous system. Kind of like when you're sitting at a beach and you get that reset and, and, but there's so much more than just like, oh, I'm, you know, why is it actually resetting your nervous system? So I was fascinated by each temple and pyramid had its own purpose. You know, some of them were more for the fertility, like he was mentioning, and some were more for healing. And so it was just so fascinating to me to see like that they were already thinking on this level and we're only just like scratching the surface now in, in our modern education of getting to this point. Um, and technology now has gotten so advanced, but we're still not even near what they already had created then. So it was, it was super amazing for me. And I, I know Jason felt it, but I, I was literally like vibrating the whole time. <laughs> like, what is going on? Tell us a little bit more about that, what you experienced, because um, yeah, a lot of the energy that these pyramids were producing, you know, as Muhammad would, would say, it's been shut off, but you can still feel some of this energy at certain places. Tell us where you may, might have felt energy the most, Carla. Which site was it? Do you remember? Uh, it started at the Steps Pyramid. Um, even on walking out around the outside of it. And I had to like actually walk away because I thought like, am I crazy? And I, I, I just like kept feeling my arms particularly vibrating, especially my hands. Like, and, and it was so intense. And then when we would go away, it would kind of dissipate. I remember John and I were also like, am I crazy? Do you feel this too? And he's like, I feel it too. <laughs> and then we went to the Hawthor one and that one I was just like, my whole body, I was just like, whoa, it just felt so true. I think that's the only way I can describe it. Like you can, like what is truth actually, but truth is like a feeling and it just felt so true to me. And even if it wasn't as active as Muhammad says it is normally, it was, it felt active to me and I can't possibly imagine how active it felt back then. Thanks for sharing. That is so incredible. You mentioned Jason's experience. So Jason, we'll jump to you. I think we were visiting, wasn't it, um, Isis Temple, and we were entering what's considered the Holy of Holies, the inner part of this structure where you enter this, you know, basically this square room. And inside this square room, obviously the walls are lined with just uh, ancient Egyptian depictions and hieroglyphs. And on the center, the floor is covered with wood. And Muhammad had a theory for that. You can share that, why that was, Jason. Um, but protruding out of this wooden floor deck is what looks like an ancient energy charging device. Tell us what you experienced in there, Jason, and how long it lasted and your experience. You're right. It was at the, the Isis temple, so uh, Fila um, in Aswan. And uh, we walked into this Holy of Holies. Um, I wasn't even really thinking intentionally about it, but I just placed my left hand, just a few fingers um, on this, this granite block. Um, and I felt this like rush of energy, just like maybe a second, second and a half, um, unmistakable from my feet all the way up to my head, um, kind of like an adrenaline rush, but it wasn't, it was a different feeling. It's a different sensation. Uh, very, very positive feeling like this, like empowering, like, you know, <laughs> jolt. Um, and I, I was just sitting there with my hand on the, the block kind of looking around, like, you know, is anyone else feeling this? Oh my gosh. Uh, and it, it's interesting because, um, Muhammad had been talking and explaining to us how like all of these temples, 
um, the small or the large had some sort of a, a healing component or some sort of a healing center. Um, and they are all, you know, based on their their location and the materials that were used to construct them and the design of them, um, different, right? So they it would make sense that they kind of emit different, slightly different frequencies, or at least they might, right? So uh, he explained after the fact that, um, you know, we're all getting vast in these energies. And like Carla was ex explaining, like uh, the Carla and a few other folks on on the tour had been expressing this, that like, oh my gosh, we're like walking through these temples. Like this feels pretty, <laughs> like it's wild. Uh, but I hadn't felt anything to that point. So it seems that something with the specific frequency, like the resonant frequency or whatever it is of my body in that particular location, you know, touching that stone, which, you know, granted is, has different um, chemical and, you know, resonant or electrical properties than obviously the wood that we're walking around on these planks. And like, it was almost like a, a conductive sort of mechanism by making that contact. I got this, like this, uh, you know, a friend of mine called it like an energy transfusion, uh, which totally resonated. And that <laughs> lasted. I mean, I was honestly having a hard time putting words together for about an hour there. I was just so like, oh, yeah, uh, it was really it was like this magical feeling and until I went to sleep that night it was probably like nine or 10 hours later. I, I was feeling this full body, like my arms and legs and my chest is sort of like resonant feeling uh, like an adrenaline rush, but different. And uh, yeah, that was to me, very eye-opening and, and mind-blowing. We could talk so much just about, yeah, this, some of what we were experiencing and feeling. Alan, I want to jump to you, the geologist, because uh, Jason just mentioned, you know, the properties of some of these stones. Um, talk to us a little bit about your thoughts, Alan. You're a geologist. You've spent a lifetime studying the properties of stones and rocks. And what was your takeaways going to Egypt and you might have already known a lot about this, but just hearing from Muhammad and others, myself, about all these different, the, how these the structures were built with specific materials for sp specific purposes, uh, whether it was the limestone on the outside of the Great Pyramid or the rose granite inside the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I purposely went on the trip, uh, not reading much and just wanted to go with an open mind. King's tunnels of uh, Saqqara were just so impressive to me. The mountain ranges here in the West are typically cored by uh, older granitic-like uh, rocks. And, you know, I'm a Neanderthal. I don't, I don't feel much in terms of energies. And, uh, but when you're on solid, old Precambrian uh, igneous rocks, uh, you know you're on solid ground. And uh, to be in those rooms consisted of uh, these huge megalithic blocks of uh, of that granite in the in the sarcophagi that are made of diorite, even more dense uh, than the granite itself. It's just uh, it's a very steady, solid feeling, and uh, to be in the presence of those little alcoves with those huge boxes. Uh, uh, had a tremendous Im impact on me, and I'll I'll be wondering about that for a lifetime. I bet. Alan, wasn't it fascinating that? So you've got the Giza pyramids, and inside, so the outside is limestone, right? The 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 blocks, yet inside the these intricate and precision uh, chambers, the so-called king's chamber, for example, it's made of this rose granite that you referenced. Inside the the Giza pyramid, you know. It, Obviously, they had chopped a tunnel in uh, at the level that we entered, but then it intersected the original tunnels that they had built. And it's just a huge contrast in terms of the architecture and planning and execution of it. It was just a beautiful experience to travel through those chambers or uh, the tunnels leading to the chambers. And then to spend time in that one room was just uh, a tremendous uh, experience. And you can see that they, whatever the reason was, they had clear intentions of what they were doing. Let's jump to uh, Dave and Becky here from the UK. So Dave, you are a stone cutter by trade and you were showing me some photos and videos of the amazing um, things you cut with these giant sure. machines and yeah. even uh, it's like 3D print machines, right? So tell us about what you do a little bit 
and the stone that you you're shaping and cutting and then your takeaways of seeing again these these stones some that weigh 70 tons in the king's chamber or you saw the unfinished obelisk which is over 1200 tons how in the world were they doing this so yeah we cut limestone which is quarried on the island the machines i use are five axis cnc machines and you use computers to 3d draw things like it's like the the slab we've seen outside the pyramid uh which had like 12 sides we'd use a computer to draw that and then we'd use the file put it on our saw and then use a camera to take a picture and then you put the file where you need it on the slab but with the 70 ton blocks the biggest slabs, uh, biggest blocks of stone we use in our factory are up to 18 ton. And even that is a struggle for us, really, because our forklifts are 16 ton. So I don't know how they'd move a 70, uh, a 70 ton block without a 70 ton forklift. <laughs> That's the easiest way I could describe it. But And something about like the frequencies that people were feeling, because Mohammed said, that some people don't feel them if they're near coasts or live on, um, like li- li- live near limestone. And because that's what we said, wasn't it? Because mm. we didn't really feel anything. But then he said that if you live near the sea, which we do, that you would already be experiencing it, especially if you live near limestone. But yeah, because I, because I was kind of upset that I didn't feel anything. Mm. But then he said that and it, it was kind of like, oh, okay. Kind of maybe we are experiencing it on a daily basis anyway. But I did feel something in the red pyramid. But I can't tell if it was like a um a mixture of ex- like exertment, because I was quite excited, but I felt like a bond towards everybody. Like immediately when we were in the little uh chamber. Especially like I don't it was just a, like a, a friendship kind of thing, like for people I've only met for two days. But yeah, it was great. And in the Dendera temple, where I felt a, a calming feeling. Like, it was really, especially when he mentioned the um, female, what was he said? Muhammad was talking about um, the female energy there. And it was kind of like a calming energy, and I could feel that for sure. I felt at peace almost. Becky, I know you were amazed by... Um the absolute massive colossal statues at Luxor temple. These things are, I don't even know how tall they are, but they're, they're, they're larger than life, right? Yet they feature muscle tone and tell us what you were amazed by. That was on the backs of these massive uh, statues. So on the back of them, they had hieroglyphs that I can't imagine them being cut by hand at all they were so precise and so even that I feel like if I were to touch them I would like damage myself the edges were just so crisp it was I just couldn't like get over how clean it all was I agree with you it was that was one of my favorite things I saw I was telling you before we hit record that I saw that site last year but it was at night and so it was really hard to get quality video and photo let alone see these intricate 3d printed symbols on the backs of these statues we saw those at other sites as well but there was something special about those so um i was blown away by that tim let's jump to you and then we'll go back to carla uh tim you and i had some great conversations on the trip you seem very well read on the subject of pre-diluvian verse dynastic Egyptian. And for people who, you know, might be new to all this, mainstream Egyptology and history tells us that these dynastic Egyptians of 3000 BC built all of this in Egypt, built the pyramids as tombs, built these ancient temples. Um, And the dynastic Egyptians were an amazing civilization. We don't want to discount that. Just looking at the archaeological record from what we know what tools and materials they had. Um, unless they had secret lost technology, they could not craft, right, Tim? 
rose granite that's a seven on the Mohs scale with their softer copper tools. So t- tell us a little bit about your thoughts on all that and what amazed you most. First off, when we talk about the Moss scale, when you go through all these different rocks, you know, you get uh, granite, diorite, basalt. These are all eight or nine on the Moss scale. Then, you know, usually you get this neat little ordered history in the museums where they have these nice little placards and things that uh, read to you that all of this was made with, you know, very basic hand tools made of copper, right? And copper was pretty plentiful, but it's very weak in terms of just bashing up against a rock, right? And uh, what I found the most interesting of, of all the places that we went was the Serapium, right? where you go down into this uh, this tunnel system, right, where these corridors are, you know, relatively narrow. And uh, you have to walk downstairs into them, and the corridor that you go into is is rounded, and it's maybe only three or four arm breaths, you know, uh, wingspans across. And when you go in there, there are these 25 massive boxes made out of, like I said earlier, granite, diorite, basalt. And we're made to believe that they made perfect 90 degree angles and smoothed all of these things and, and rounded curves on the boxes with just copper. And I, I just found that absolutely uh, absurd to say the least. But w- with these boxes, right, you have to think of the logistics of one, just getting these boxes down there because these boxes are two meters tall, two meters wide and more than likely, uh, you know, like four meters in length, right? And so you weigh this and this is a 40 ton box. And then you remember, oh wait, there's a lid on these two and that's another 20 ton. So we're talking about moving 60 tons of material through these narrow corridors downstairs. I don't know if you've ever moved furniture into a new house, but you know, just moving these giant boxes around quarters is is a logistical nightmare. <laughs> I mean, in, to say the very least, and and the fact that they lowered them down another set of stairs to be perfectly centered in each chamber, right? And so my thought was, okay, we have the form. You know, these boxes have a certain form uh, on the lids. They're made to seal, right? They have these uh, unique little lips on the bottom side of the lid so that they shut and that they stay sealed. They're not opening anytime soon, right? And so we have that form. So what function did it serve? What what was its purpose of being down there? I mean, we're told that it was some kind of uh, sarcophagus or that they were used uh, to store. What, what's the main story? It was a golden calf that uh, the one that got blown up. The guy found a whole bunch of, uh, you know, idols and things like that. But we don't know where they are. So pretty convenient. My thought on those boxes were that. Uh, for the purpose of sealing them, that they could have been used as storage units because we we know, I mean, it's just so obvious. Anything made out of granite, basalt, or diorite had to have been made pre-dynastic because the dynastic Egyptians were using mainly limestone, and we've, we've seen that. Uh, we have plenty of examples of that, and their tooling would be indicative of that's like their limitation is using limestone. And so my thought on the Serapium boxes are that they were for storage for possible, um, like grain silos, if you will, for maybe the next cataclysm and that they can preserve their agricultural um, heritage, if you will. Carla, any um, other epiphanies you had on this trip or did you have a favorite uh, site um, or was there anything else um that just took you back that you weren't expecting on this trip? I mean, I didn't have a lot of pre-education, so all of it was mind-blowing to me. I think my favorite, and I think it's Dentara is the technical name, but the one that was like the Hathor temple, that, I mean, just, I think the the quality of the images that are still on the rocks was able to see that even the colors and the zodiac signs and the different portals and universes, and I was just like, And Muhammad is so amazing that he can actually read that and showing things, you know, like the symbolism of the snake and the genie and all this mythology that we've been told, but kind of in a different way, it was all right there. And I'm like, that was just so fascinating for me that we've been talking about these things forever. And 
you know, you can say astrology is woo woo, but it was like they were using it in such precise ways. And still to this day, we kind of use those those same ways of thinking about it. But even down to like, you know, the blue lotus and the papaya or papyrus and like how they combine that to elicit a different state of mind. And it was all just like written there very similar to what we do now with different plants and ways that we, we try and say, how can I, and how can we enhance our ability and our energy? Um, I think that, that just like looking in that room, I was just so blown away and in awe the whole time. But honestly, I also agree with Tim that, um, I don't remember the exact name of that place, but it, Muhammad describing it like an energy grid, like they were preparing for the next time that they had to go underground and how can they still preserve energy from earth and above i mean the whole thing just blew my mind and and the 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 also this i've also been to peru and i know you're you're doing a trip the similarities of that i was like this looks exactly like it did in in peru it's so and like exactly i'm like that also i was just like how is this how are we just like letting go of the concept that this wasn't all connected um so yeah i mean literally like jason was saying or maybe it was Dave, like from, from day one. And I, for me, it just kept building and building and building And every place we went, even the ISIS temple as well. I was just like, it just keeps getting more and more like, whoa, there, this is like an undeniable truth that they had this knowledge that we are even trying to scratch the surface to get back to at this point. And, and like I said, I, I work with the nervous system and, and everything that they talk about is what we're trying to create with technology right now, right? We're trying to create electric stim and laser and how can we input the nervous system with technology but they were already doing it with s tools from the earth and stone and the stars and i was just like this is just true to me it just felt so right and what what we're trying to kind of go back to in our elementary version <laughs> i like how you said that what we're trying to go back to I mean, that's it right there. It's, I'm glad you brought up uh, Dendera Temple, or that's the Dendera Temple complex, which has the Hathor Temple. That to me was one of my favorite sites. Um, these last two years I've gone, it's literally larger than life. Again, if you're new to this, our, um, our tour guide is Muhammad Ibrahim, who's also an uh, Egyptologist, brilliant mind, and one of the few Egyptologists on the planet that has broken with mainstream and believes that a earlier civilization actually built the pyramids and a lot of these megalithic temples. He, he refers to them as the pre-Diluvian ancient Egyptians. So they would have predated the dynastic Egyptians who came along in 3000 BC and repurposed everything and built on top of the ruins, right? Um, maybe similar to how we see what the Inca did in Peru. They came along and in the 1400s and built on top of these megalithic foundations. Um, but I, I'm glad you bring up that Hathor temple. The color is, is beyond belief, the blue color. And um, these ancient pre-Diluvian Egyptians, they had this high order of astronomical knowledge, right? They had profound knowledge regarding the principles responsible for the created universe. When you start learning about their creation mythos, um, they had this precise and profound universal knowledge of, of harmonics, proportional laws, and mathematics and scientific knowledge. And you just see it embedded in these temples, specifically the Hathor Temple. Um, but it's not written like in the temples and texts, but you see it depicted, right, in a harmony, proportion, and the symbols. And I just left actually on this, this trip with more questions than answers. Like I was truly more amazed about who these pre diluvian ancient Egyptians were. Um, and they seem to be so at harmony uh, in a sense with the earth. Um, everything was holistic, um, simple yet high, high tech. And, um, Again, the pyramids are one thing. These ancient temples are another. 
And then you've got the statues, and I even believe we have their pottery, like we saw in the um, Egyptian Museum. Does anybody want to talk about any of those topics, the pottery you saw, or these uh, pre-Diluvian statues with muscle tone and the 3D symbols? I felt like I got to the point where I was even like, I can tell the difference. <laughs> I'm like, this one is clearly perfectly smooth. And this one is like, you know, I could have done that. And that you can really like see it very clearly. You're like, this one was very advanced. And this is like, it was chipped by copper limestone, like you were saying. And, and the, the portals and the stargates, like seeing how they were trying to create ways for us to see the, the universe differently. And even his conversation about how our aliens are potentially our ancestors that were able to elevate out and that they check on us. And that, you know, there's just so many different conversations that I'm like, whoa, I've never thought about it like that. And it feels true to me. Jason, did you have a favorite uh, site or um, something that just uh, really surprised you that you saw on this trip? Well, definitely the Fela Temple stands out, but um, the Osarion as well like stands out in my mind. That um, is, uh, it's next to like the temple in Abydos, but it's it's much lower in the ground, and for whatever reason, that just felt so much older to me. Like it, it kind of the construction there um, reminded me of some of the construction in the like the temple next to the Sphinx, and like what you see in Peru, and like all these sites around the world. You can, kind of Google some of those similarities and it's, it's mind blowing, but that just felt older and just somehow more, uh, there was like more weight to it. Like it kind of confirmed, uh, as if nothing else had, but like so many things on this trip did that there was like this older kind of, uh, remnants of a, an older civilization. Um, and to me, uh, some things that stood out, like, um, you know, the, the, the precision at scale of all of these sites is mind blowing. Like some of the things that we saw, like, you know, precision or uh, saw cuts and drill marks and all that stuff. Like you could, you know, go for years and just continue to like study all that. But my mind goes to why and so what, right? Like there was clearly so much intention behind building and constructing these, these monuments and these sites that, um, had some specific function like you wouldn't go to that effort to build something that would be indestructible and last through you know the millennia um without a clear plan in mind and um you know the the idea of healing centers really resonates the idea that these um temples were like academies of teaching is a term that muhammad uh used so like the Ndera where they have these massive beautiful drawings and all these stories that they're depicting um but also this idea of like their understanding these ancient Egyptians understanding of consciousness and like trying to like, like make a, like a timeless uh, teaching of like their understanding of the cosmos and how to elevate consciousness and like the different symbols of the blue Lotus all over these different temples. Like they clearly had some way of connecting to a, a higher level of a plane of, of knowing or existence or whatever that was. And that was something that, um, you know, I, I, heard about or learned about but it's just very it's something you can't miss once you start to see that sort of understanding of um their place in the world and and the fact that they made such precise um uh, monuments temples pyramids to to either enhance or elevate that a lot of work has been done throughout the desert of egypt and uh you know my i think about being a kid and tunneling down and making forts and uh these these people really knew what they were doing and uh, whether it was just plain habitation survival in a desert extreme climate or they had intentions of escaping and being protected muhammad would always talk about how every site was uh, insulated by all the mud brick complexes and it's just astounding how much work went into doing all that insulation work. You know, timing is always a, a, an issue in terms of when, was, when were things built and uh, in relationship to all that. But uh, just the sheer volume of work that was produced is overwhelming. And uh, you just don't do that on a whim.
you have uh, clear intentions of, of doing something that's going to be productive for you in your life and, uh, and beyond. I'm glad you bring up these mud walls that were found encasing all these ancient temples. And um, according to Muhammad and many others, you know, mud is an insulator. And so it's like the dynastic Egyptians, when they came along and found these megalithic marvels, they, it's almost like at one point in time, eons ago, it was, you know, free energy for all, right? Or free healing at this temple. The dynastics show up, surround it with mud, insulating this, these healing properties, this energy and keeping it for themselves, right? Or keeping it or, or to make you pay to get it. Or, um, and isn't that kind of like human nature? I found it fascinating when we went to the Bent Pyramid, how um, these rock crystals are all over on the ground surrounding it, right? And they're not found at the Red Pyramid next door. It was just at that Bent Pyramid. And when you look at the Bent Pyramid, you see and I hate that name because it gives it a connotation that there's something wrong with it. There clearly is, and it was created like that, right? Because I can't remember how many feet up, but the the wall tilts in at a 45 or the roof tilts in at a 45-degree angle. But you can see um, like uh, these markings on the, the roof of this pyramid where it's like the uh, material was leaking out. And um, I think Muhammad's theory is that it was creating, um, I'm blanking. What was it called? Oh, ammonia. Ammonia. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was Jason, producing ammonia go, and you can see <laughs> Jason saves the day. You can see it leaking out literally on the roof, those spots. Yeah. And he, and the theory is that those rock crystals on top were an insulator. So stuff like that, um, I'm bragging, I guess, on our tour. Your average tour is not going to know anything about any of that. Um, but I just love that we were learning about that stuff. Uh, Dave, Becky, Tim, anything else that just blew you away, jumped out at you that you feel like we've got to talk about uh, on this episode? Uh, the granite vases in the uh, museum. I found it bizarre that they were hidden away almost behind like pillars compared to the other work. Like the most yeah. perfect stuff was hidden, like behind cases. But also that big block that was the granite box that had the uh, imperfect cut in it. Because to me, it looks like someone has gone in too fast of a blade and that's caused a wobble, which would cause the bend. And like my friend at work thinks that, Kevin, that it looks as if someone has found this technology has, don't know how to use it and have, they've used it incorrectly which has caused the strange cut but it also looks like because Mohammed was saying that two blades were used but in my eyes it looks like one was used and it was flipped and then they'd cut the other half but it doesn't really explain why there was a bit left at the edge just the bent pyramid as well like you say I can't see how Whoever made these clearly found it very easy. And in my eyes, if it was a mistake, they wouldn't have finished it the way they had. Fascinating. I, Dave, I'm glad you brought up in that Egyptian museum. I mean, we could have spent three days there. Yeah, easily. There was so much, <laughs> so much to uncover. And like you, like you said, some of the greatest artifacts in the entire museum are just hidden behind a pillar doesn't even get its own case. It's just out in the open, sitting on top of this thing. We could go put our hand in it. And then the box, to me, is the greatest thing in that entire museum because it shows the evidence of lost ancient tech. They had a giant machine with some kind of blade that was cutting that. You can see it from the top, the bottom, every angle. The other side's hollowed out. That is literally, I did a video um, I kind of walked away from our group after we left that block and you see all these other tour groups looking at dynastic stuff around it and it's just dark off in the corner and it's, it's just like forgotten, you know, nothing to see here. Um, but one of the greatest things you could see. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Tim, what about you, man? What was your 
other takeaways? Yeah. So uh, going back again to the bent pyramid, I think we all just uh, kind of overlooked the the gypsum or calcite that we found these shards, you know, surrounding the entire base or parameter of the pyramid. And uh, I loved when Mohammed brought up that uh, this this gypsum or calcite uniformly covered the entire pyramid. And you, you think, okay, like maybe, oh, a mosaic or something like they were just kind of gluing these pieces on. No, uh, calcite and, and gypsum and things like that, they, they percolate from limestone when it's uh, exposed to groundwater. When we found these shards all over the place, I mean, they, they were uniform in depth. I mean, any part that you picked up, it was all about a, a quarter or a half an inch. So my thought was how in the world would they have uniformly covered this where the entire thing was one solid piece all the way around the limestone, right? And so my thought was the Egyptians or the pre-dynastic or antediluvian Egyptians, they, they had some sort of uh, DIY grow your own geodes at home kind of kit. And so they, they would have known how to manipulate, they would have known how to manipulate these stones and actually to bleed or sweat this material out of the limestone. And that, I mean, to me, like I grabbed so many of those pieces, <laughs> like I, I loved looking at them and just the fact that they were all like the same, uh, uh, thickness too, just blew my mind, which means that they were probably polishing it too, which uh, again, like, where are they getting all these tools? Where are these tools? Who was doing this kind of stuff? It just blew my mind. Okay. So this was the first time all of you were in a, in a pyramid or the great pyramid, correct? Yes. Nod. Okay. So you might've heard me talk about this before. This was one of my big revelations last year. And I had been to Egypt back in 2008 and been in a pyramid. Uh, but I did know back then, you know, what I've learned these last few years. So I want to set this up and I want to then open the floor for any of you guys to talk about this. But so you're in the great pyramid. If you guys went down to the subterranean chamber, which is the you know the lowest chamber under the bedrock, that is at least a 300 foot steep uh, descent, right? You're you're bent over because you can't stand upright, and even if you have minimal gear on, a small backpack, you're holding these railings. You're on these little wooden step planks. Modern day, it's a it's a rough haul, right? And then just to get in some of these chambers, you know, you have to bend over in the subterranean chamber. You literally have to do a belly crawl almost to get in. And so I want to hear your takeaways. Do you guys really think if these were built as tombs by the dynastic Egyptians of 3000 BC, you, if you remove these uh, railings and, and wooden stair planks, can you really picture the dynastic Egyptians with hundreds or thousands of people traversing up and down on their way to a funeral with massive sarcophaguses and statues, um, not able to stand upright? Do you think that was possible? Uh, particularly when we went into the Valley of the Kings, you know, the some of those tunnels were obviously plastered over and the hieroglyphic paintings are, are gorgeous, but... Uh, to me, it's like when you go down to where the actual sarcophagi are, the boxes, uh, the boxes scream to me that this was done by other people long before the uh, the tomb tomb uh, occupiers uh, came along. Great insight, um, Becky. Did you have any other um, insights, um, favorite moments to share? I couldn't get my head around how, like. Obviously, you grow up, you see pictures of everything, and like you learn about it in school. But just being there, just it's so much bigger, and they just don't do it justice. And I feel like everywhere we went, I was just blown away by the size and the like how they decorated everything and how everything's been preserved. Still, can't think of any anything that I could now that I could compare it to. And this is coming from somebody who you guys live in the UK and you get to see all these castles and you get to see uh, Stonehenge. But this was even greater than that, wasn't it? Carla, I got to go back to you. So when we were first starting off with you, you rambled off super fast. Some of the stuff you're actually using 
to uh, treat people, to heal them. Can you just spend a few more minutes on that? Um, for slow people like me, just say it a little slower so I can take this in. Yeah. Um, just because that's so intriguing to me. How? Because I love that, again, you're a doctor, and you basically say we're trying to get back to what they were doing way better in the ancient days. Tell us more about that. When I lecture about the the nervous system, I always start by like, let's back up and like, what is the f- purpose of the nervous system? Why do we even have a nervous system? Why are we different than plants and trees? Because chemically, we're pretty similar in a lot of ways. But the difference is because we move. And, and that's because we have to defy gravity. And so when we look at how can we integrate the nervous system, we look at the way that we move reflexively, the way that we move with gross motor, the way that we move with fine motor and the electrical input of that frequency of firing, just like in electricity, when you're looking at, you know, the way electricity works, it's, it's a, it's a resonance. And our body literally develops based off of that resonance. And so we can use that in, in medicine to say, okay, we're going to, you know, a really basic example is you injure a muscle and you put an electric stimulation pad on it to alter that frequency of firing so that it makes that muscle feel better. We can also use laser and light. Um, and this has been done for almost decades now. It's still relatively, you know, the biohacking world is is doing this and, and talking about it now more than we ever have been. But it's we're still only scratching the surface of having these conversations of like, what else can we do besides a drug to alter that frequency of firing? And there's were, there's so many possibilities and it just felt to me like they already had it figured out. And, and we are trying to find different ways to regulate ourselves and heal ourselves using what can we do besides just a drug? And we are only, we only have such a limited amount of technology at this point and, and great technology. I think we're only getting there. And now we have frequency chambers and, you know, even like I said, ozonated oxygen and sound and resonance. And going back to my initial comment on gravity, most of our nervous system is responding to, a low level frequency and those frequencies base everything off of like how, when we fall, can I fall asleep right now? Is it going too high? And, and our ability to heal on a cellular level. So to me, it was just like, they already did it all. They just knew. And I was actually blown away by that. There was 127 pyramids and each of them all, all throughout Egypt and that each of them has a different healing purpose, all with Muhammad's theory that they all were with a purpose of different frequency to heal or bring humans up to a different frequency of firing in our nervous system that we maybe weren't capable of anymore. No, that's so fascinating. Uh, Thanks for sharing that. I would say that if you're curious about Egypt and the pyramids and everything that we've been discussing, don't hesitate to go with Derek and Mohammed and Saboteurs. From the moment you land to the moment you leave Egypt, you are handled and uh, with people who are looking out for you and they make everything so easy to focus and enjoy the sights that uh, we all came to see. So A plus Derek. Thanks so much, Alan. I did not pay him to say that either. <laughs> it was an amazing tour. Uh, seriously, thanks to each of you for coming. And uh, again, I consider each of you friends and just exciting to get to follow up and do something like this. And thanks for your time today and for sharing your experiences. And um, man, I just hope that maybe We will all meet again. I know the rumor is some of you want to come to Peru in 2024. So that would be epic. Yes. Honestly, best trip. I I have traveled a lot, but that was like top trip for me. And Mohammed is truly like the best tour guide I've ever been with.
and you, Derek, for organizing it and putting together such an amazing group of people. Well, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed this episode. Uh, make sure to subscribe to this podcast. And um, like Alan and some of the others uh, said, Carla, uh, consider joining us uh, on our Egypt tour next year in 2024 in May. You can visit megalithicmarvels.com slash tours or just click the link in the show notes uh, below. And until next time, keep exploring.